and welcome back to the Patriska YouTube channel. Today I'm joined by my regular co-host Marcus Vincent and special guest Dr. Mike Duncan. Mike is the Professor of Technical Communication at the University of Houston downtown and wrote a book in 2022 entitled Rhetoric and the Synoptic Problem published with Fortress Academic and it's on my reading list so I hope it is on yours too, link down in the description if you want to buy it. Mike has prepared a short uh, presentation for us today on the argument from silence, something that Marcus has engaged with in the past and hopefully now as a podcast we will learn about together. So Mike, over to you, what have you got? Um, to sort of position myself a little bit here, um, I'm more or less a rhetorical critic and a rhetorician by training. I'm not a New Testament scholar or an expert on patristics, so I'm kind of seeing this, this these sort of textual issues from a remove. I work in an English department. I teach technical communication and an undergraduate and master's program, and but there's my connection to it is through classical rhetoric. I teach rhetorical theory, criticism, um, argumentation theory. And so when I look at early Christian texts, I look at it from the basis of what kind of arguments are they making? In particular, how are their arguments interacting with each other? Um, so my interest in the argument of silence was, I came at it through Paul. So that piece I wrote in Informal Logic, um, revisiting the argument from silence, was originally supposed to be a piece on, you know, why and Paul are, are there's, there's no mention of a lot of gospel material. There's little bits and pieces, but there's not a lot in the New Testament text, obviously. Um, I looked at it and I was like, you know, again, I'm not a New Testament scholar to do the work properly and place this into, you know, Society for Biblical Literature Journal is outside of my field of expertise. But I can approach it from the angle of argument and put it in informal logic, which is what I did. And I tried to think of, you know, what is the most accessible way to talk about this? Because you get into, you know, the intricacies of uh, what is Paul aware of and placing him in the first century. Pretty complicated. How can I make this more accessible? I know. Sherlock Holmes. So this is one of my favorite articles because it combines three things that are very precious to me. One is argument. One is early Christianity. The other is Sherlock Holmes. I managed to stuff them all into a single article. Um, if I could have put Star Wars in there, I would have, but, you know, that's another piece, right? Um, I actually do have an art, uh, uh, idea about that, but I'll have to wait. Um, so when I started looking into it, I noticed that, you know, not a lot of people have looked into it, and the usual suspects have it. Aristotle doesn't talk about it in his fiscal refutations. Um, Hamlet doesn't talk about it in fallacies, and fallacies is a book this thick. You think he would have got around to it, but he doesn't. It's, it's almost as if there is a an, argu an argument of silence to be made about the argument of silence. Where is it? <laughs> um, and the more I look into it, I realize that it's an argument that is almost synonymous with an appeal to authority. It's universally seen as a weak argument because it's an argument from negative evidence. And how can the absence of evidence be evidence? It's not intuitive. It's difficult to understand. So I use the Silver Blaze example where Holmes, you know, he's investigating the theft of a horse at a stable and, you know, nobody knows who has done it. And then he says, well, you know, there was a curious incident that night. You know, Watson and the other people there are like, what curious incident? Well, the fact that the dog didn't bark, that's the curious incident. It's the absence of the bark that is evidence that suggests that in the chain of ev the chain of reasoning here seems to be abductively that because the dog did not bark, then anyone who stole the horse, presumably a human, would have, have to have gotten past the horse, excuse me, gotten past the dog without it barking, which meant the dog knew the person, most likely, probably. So we get into some basics here. It's always a probabilistic argument. It's never a certain argument. We're not forming a syllogism here. We're forming an inference that can lead to other arguments. In the article, I call it a stepping stone. It doesn't really hold any weight in itself. It's like jumping across a pond across lily pads. 
Don't stay on the lily pad too long, but it will get you to the other side where there are more interesting arguments. So it's a way, it's, it, I think of it as an exploratory kind of argument. Oh, I see a missing gap here, a missing piece. There's something odd here. And then again, you get that feeling for that absence based on some kind of expertise. And can you convince somebody else in the same field of that absence? Well, it's based on your ethos as an arguer, as the consulting detective or the expert in patristics. You convince others that there's a gap, and once then you convince them, then you can move to the next part. But by itself, it's very precarious and weak. And ultimately, that's what happens in the story, is that it's not really important who stole the horse, because there's a murder coming afterwards. It's more important to solve the murder. And finding out who the horse thief is helps them solve the murder case. So it's again, it's a stepping stone. And in the case of Paul, which I examined in the article, it seems like there's an opportunity here when we say, you know, Paul doesn't seem to know a lot about the Jesus of the Gospels. He doesn't seem to know who John the Baptist is. He doesn't seem to know who Judas is. It would have been really useful when he's, you know, he's in Jerusalem, right? Uh, but he doesn't seem to know about 12 apostles. Well, he mentions 12 once, but then that passage is sometimes called in tribulation, right? Let's not go there. He doesn't know about, you know, the scourging. He doesn't know about parables. He doesn't know any Jesus parables. Does he know the same Jesus we do? This opens a door, right? It's a stepping stone to other things. What else does Paul not know? What is his, what is his view of Jesus? Where, where is he speaking from historically? And then once you've opened that door, then you can go to other arguments. So for me, it's an important historical tool. So when I see somebody say, well, no, 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 we cannot use arguments from science, well, that's 90% of history right there. You've just thrown out the door. We can't ask questions. We should be able to ask questions. We can't see gaps, then how do we get to the discovering things that we don't know? Um, and I just said a lot of things I probably should have put in the article. Well, that was 10 years ago, and you know, obviously our thought develops over time. Uh, so that's kind of where I am at with it. You know, when I, when I, when I see someone say, you know, don't use this argument, I'm like, well, I definitely need to try that out. When someone says, don't do something, I definitely want to go in that direction. So we have our first stepping stone, as you've mentioned, but where's, where's this led you to, you know, it's okay. Good. We've got the first stepping stone, but the immediate question then is where, what's the next step? Where has that got you to with your Pauline work? Well, that's as far as I went with Paul. Um, <laughs> uh, I ended up writing a book about the Gospels, which w was uh, based on my dissertation. I had a very long gestation period. Um, and my argument for the Gospels is more along the lines that they are in a competition with each other. I call it competing narratives. So, you know, the the story that we get from Arrhenius and Asubius and whatnot is that, you know, they're the fourfold gospel. It's like the four winds. They're complementary. Even John, who comes in later, according to Asubius, you know, is still, you know, in the same sort of tradition. But to me, they're trying to replace each other. And they're doing so according to some rules that we do, it's, it's like they're, uh, if you remember the, the story of how Frankenstein was written, you know, Byron and Shelley had this contest at night. I kind of think of the Gospels like at some point in the second century, there was a Gospel writing contest with very peculiar rules that we don't know. We don't know what the rules were. But at some point, someone had to come in and negotiate who won this contest. And instead of there being one winner, there's four winners had a finger there. And of course, there's uh, Mark Honoff, a guy, excuse me, actually, I was first. Um, but uh, so there's a dispute. And there's a rhetorician, not as you know, a New Testament scholar, my interest is that there's a contest at all. Why is there not just one gospel that everyone agreed on immediately? Uh, why write a gospel in the first place? What kind of argument are you trying to make by writing a narrative of Jesus's life? Why do you need a narrative of Jesus's life? Um, one of the things I ended the book on, and this was kind of an admission of my part and how wrong I was, is that 
I avoided dating until the very end of the book. I just put it in an appendix. And I gave four different, I don't know, six different ways to date the Gospels. Um, I can, I'm happy to report to you later that all those are wrong. Um, I'd push it even further. I, you know, I, at this point, I can no longer defend the Gospels written in the first century, at least the canonical Gospels. They're moving slowly and surely past 120 for me, 130, maybe even 140. Um, and the reason for this is that the more I think about how Arrhenius presents them, is that there must have been a challenge to how they were presented as a set of four. And that challenge was serious enough that it had to be defended. But that's also covering up, I think, that there was a contest at all. How do you find yourself in a position where you have to defend four Gospels that are obviously written at cross purposes for one another, at least in my view? The author of Matthew has a different rhetorical goal than the author of Mark. And the author of Luke has a different goal than Mark or Matthew. Same for John. And same for any of the other Gospels, many of which we simply don't have access to anymore. We have bits and pieces where we have reconstructions based on uh, mentions, as with Marcus. Um, they're all writing for some purpose. And my view as a writer is it's trying to figure out what that purpose is. Um, for Matthew, I think it's turning Mark into something that is more acceptable. And for Luke, it's fixing a mess created by Mark and Matthew. Um, but my question in the, in the end of the book is, you know, when Luke says the ploy and then his uh, introduction, does that mean two Gospels? Does that mean two plus Gospels? Does that mean he's sorting through 30 Gospels? We don't know. Um what kind of problem is he resolving? And he's that, that, that very long sentence there, that elaborate Greek sentence, is so carefully composed to not say things and also say other things. It seems like he's avoiding naming names to me. <laughs> what names is he not naming? Um, and this is, you know, I mean, we also don't know when he's writing. I mean, it could be a she, is for all we know. Whether or not those Gospels have names attached to them at that point. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. We don't know. Um, we're working with so little information. And so when, we look at the, when I look at the Gospels, I think of almost every argument I'm making is based on some kind of argument from silence. Oh, there's an interesting gap here. What can I fill this with? Well, it turns out there's 15 things I could fill it with. And every time I fill it with one thing, I have to, be, I have to commit to it to stepping onto that lily pad before I can get to the next lily pad. And yeah, at some point I have to say, you know, is this chain going to get me across the pond? And if it does get me across the pond, will it get someone else across? But I'd say the most fascinating thing to me about the Gospels, having looking back on the book and looking at the Gospels for the last 15 years or so, is that the fourfold argument won. Why it won is still a mystery to me. I think it's because it was the most convenient political solution to an absolute mess of gospel writing. Let's just settle on these four. They kind of sort of are similar to each other. We can sort of shove John in there. Um, this two God stuff that Marcon is going on about, that's right out. Gospel of Peter, we got a floating cross. If it was in existence at that point, we got to throw that one out so on and so forth, but it's, it's sort of a political convenience at that point is fascinating to me. Um, and I think, you know, the, the direction of gospel research that goes in an Urmark or a, um, an Urmarkon, that's something my book fails to incorporate fully. I mention it, but I don't, incorporated as fully as I would like because there was a risk in doing so. If I acknowledge that there is an Urmark or a Urmark Hun, then I have to readdress all of the arguments of science I made through the entire book. So I kind of cheated and put the dating at the end. So I wouldn't have to commit to it too much. 
but I think, you know, there is a, if I'm monologuing here, please stop me. Um, I think there's some points of contact here. If there is sort of a two traditions here that are in conflicting, two re gospel writing traditions conflicting over here, there's sort of a proto-Orthodox mess, which is Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And then we have uh, Marshawn over here, who is either predating them or post-dating them, depending on who you believe. Um, then we have John, who is either is either coming in after those or just before. Difficult to place. I think in the last dating, I tried to place Marson before John, but after Luke, which is a weird place to put him. Um, I still think of the, the canonical Gospels, we have the two that mention that there are other Gospels, which is Luke and John. John seems at least the person who wrote that ending that seems to be tacked on, seems kind of done with the whole business. You know, there's a lot of Gospels out there. You know, we could spend the rest of our lives reading them. How about you just read this one? And that's what I feel from the other kind of Gospels. It's like, why read Mark when you can read my expanded Hollywood version, the Gospel of Matthew? I mean, I've got zombies walking the streets of Jerusalem. I've got... Angels at the Tomb, this is you know, a much better production. Uh, my apostles are much smarter. Um, clearly, this is the superior gospel. But someone at least looked at that gospel and said, no, no, this is not an improvement. Actually, I want to write another one. Gospel Luke. Um, obviously, I'm following the Golder uh, Goodacre version of events, where uh, Luke knows Matthew and Mark. Um, So I'm a little out of steam at the moment, but uh... I, I think I think it's really interesting because I think that you've you've raised at least the dating of the New Testament in a really interesting way, noticing so much of what our colleagues in New Testament study looking at the Gospels fail to recognize, trying to put them earlier and earlier in, say, the 60s and 70s, rather than actually what we're seeing in our research with Marcus and Mark on this channel, that actually they're coming more later and later, and Marcus, I'm really interested to hear your view. I think what Mike brought up there's really interesting about why are these people writing gospels and the competitive nature maybe of them. And I wanted you, if you can, Marcus, to speak into what, what you think the, the motive is for these gospels. And if I might return it back to the great theme of this channel, Marcion's gospel. Now, again, whether Marcion wrote it maybe changed our opinion of why, but what do you think about that? Let's say Marcion's gospel is written by him for a moment. What do you think his motive is? And what do you think the motive is of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in, the, in their uh, literary works as well? Yeah, I'm coming back to your question, but I'd like to, to set in with uh, the first topic where the argument from silence. Um, Mike was a stepping stone for me um, with his article, which I happily uh, drew on. In, a, in an article which I've written a few years ago. And, um, but why did I come to the argument from silence and why did I write about it? Um, for me, the argument from silence was, uh, in contrast to Mike, uh, was not a stepping stone, but um, a stumbling stone. Because um, after I had published this book in uh, 2014 about Marcion and the gospel, the Synoptic Gospels, um, most of my um, reviewers and critical reviewers uh, latched on the argument from silence. And there were exactly the people Mike is writing about. I mean, they were saying, well, this is all making an evidence out of no evidence simply because I was stating, I mean, in parallel to the Gospels, what Mike was saying about Paul, uh, our second century literature, or let's say the first and second, if there was something in the first one, uh, the literature up to, let's say, up to Irenaeus, and maybe Justin, if, if you want to include Justin. But the writers up to that time do not give us any of what Mike was saying is missing in Paul. Uh, none of it. Um, and when Kurt Arland wrote about Paul in the second century, 
uh, he pointed that out. He said, how can somebody, and not just Paul, I mean, people, people know Paul, people quote him, yeah, they dispute him, uh, they, they know details about him, uh, they reference him, they might not have liked him, but uh, they know him. And how is it possible that all these people who we know are writing about Paul do not give us a dippy information, not, not a single scrap of information, yeah, about all of those things Paul doesn't know either. So no resurrection uh, scenarios, no wonder workings, no child stories, nothing of, of, of anything. I mean, all the, all the people Mike mentioned, not, nothing of that. And, and so my question was then, is, is, is this a weak form of reasoning? By, um, by thinking about the absence of something. And here I came across Mike's article, which I loved and, and I reflected upon and tried to push it even a bit further by, um, by stating what he was saying in the beginning today, that um, if we take away the argument from silence, there is no argument whatsoever left. Because if we knew everything, if everything would be completely clear. So if, if no bridge is needed, and, and that's what an argument is, it is a bridge from A to B. That includes that there is something between A and B which we don't have and that we don't know. And where we make reasonable claims, Aristotle even means claims that are certain, I rather side with Mike that most of our claims that we make, even if we are syllogistics um, uh, based, yeah, are reasonings which include a certain lack and a certain gap. And that's why we need the arguments. And as historians, I think, we need the rhetoricians because they explain to us, and I think that's the, that's the, the, the foundational thing I've learned from Mike, is that we need to move from A to B by applying some kind of methods, tools, which help us jumping from A to B. When I, when I then had um, engaged with the argument from science, I even discovered that um, it, it is in some ways a weak argument, as history is. It's always a weaker argument than logics or mathematics. But that's the case because mathematics has the rules and then applies its own rules to its own ends, like logic. And so it's quite easy. I mean, if you have a circle, right, then you end where you have started. And historians haven't got a circle, so we always end where we haven't started. So we are always in the dark, like um, Watson, which I like. And um, so, so the beauty with history is that we are moving as people in the dark and that we are always trying to have probability. So I, I rather rarely say that I know A or I know B or that A is wrong and B is right. Uh, it's always a matter of, um, of judgment and of plausibility and probability. Let me come to your question with the Gospels then. Um, I've written a book about um, resetting the Christian origins. And the biggest claim of this book is simple, that the first century is a black box. That this is something where we have almost no um, certain information, if there is certain certainty at all. But the, the more we come towards the first century, that's what the book is about, uh, the, the less we know, and the bigger the invitation is to make big statements. And so it is almost an attractive part. And that's why um, New Testament uh, attracts so many people. It is an attractive uh, element where you could pin, put in your romantic wishes and then create the foundations so that at the end of the day, you have a, a reasonable argument for doing what you think you have to do or you want to do or, or people just do, right? So it's a reconfirmation of Christian practice, I think, in the various forms. 
And it's also the same sort Mike was talking about competition. I think it is a form of competition, of contemporary con competition in this world, yeah, uh, to reconfirm your own position by having these kind of histories of the, let's say, first century. The first I can come back, and that's why I developed this kind of a, a, a retrospective method for historians that I'm saying we probably can say more about the three of us because we see each other at the, at the moment, yeah? But when we move back to what happened yesterday, uh, at least my memory is already failing me quite often, um, but that might be age. Um, but when we move backwards, uh, it, it becomes more and more precarious. Now, to come to the question of Gospels, we have no physical manuscripts from the second or the first century. The, the, the few claims that have been made of papyri from the second century have in the meantime been thrown out by uh, serious papyrologists. So I think what we've got is, with a window of about 100 years, is mid third century, maybe beginning of the third century. Yeah, And if we apply a, a window, it might be late second century. But that's what we've got at on, on physicalities, no other papyri, no other manuscripts, even not a scrap on on on, a, on on whatever. What else have we got? We have got the reports, the reports from the late or mid second century Justin's later second century Irenaeus and a few others, and we have to tell you. Um, it's interesting that Mike talks about the competition because Tertullian talks about the competition as a rhetorician, of course, yeah? And he makes up this kind of a rhetorical competition between Marcion and himself, which I find, as, an, as a rhetorian and rhetorician, I find extremely interesting. So he asks the same question, who comes first? Of course, he's the winner. He, his gospels come first, yeah? Uh, but it is interesting uh, what he puts into the mouth of his opponent. And he says that his opponent makes the same claim as he makes. So here we've got that competition of, of Gospels, and where he says Marcin has made the claim, A, that he's a traditionalist, B, that his Gospel was first. And having thought about this text for a very long time, I thought it makes more sense, logically more sense, if Marcion A is rather right than Tertullian. It's always good if an apologist gives us a few arguments that play against him. And I think, why would he have invented this type of an argument if he had not really struggled with it? First, potential thought. Second, I think it makes more sense to solve the problem that Mike has raised. Why four Gospels? If we can see in Tertullian, when he reports about Marcion's preface to his Gospel, that he claims that Marcion complains already about four, and precisely the four that we have in Irenaeus. So I think it is it is the, the easiest explanation. If these four had been put together in their competition of five, not because later ironeers love to have those four, but because somebody in the competition where all knew each other had accused four others of plagiarism. So it's not forgery, but plagiarism. He says, they've picked my, my text and I've put then later names of apostles too and of scholars of apostles too, again, to those four. And I think the easiest explanation again is that Irenaeus who writes against this bloody Marcion as he does against Balatinus, yeah, then defends exactly those four who had been claimed to be plagiarisms and to make the same argument that then is being repeated um, by Tertullian. Now, 
So why do we have four? I think because these were exactly those four who came closest to Marcion's and who were accused by Marcion to be, to be not only forgeries, but also plagiarisms. Until Irenaeus, nobody seems to complain about um, the competition of five. And even the, the, the comparison, the only comparison in Irenaeus that we have where he makes a synoptic comparison, not of four, but of five. That's the oldest synoptic comparison that we have, where he says, Mark says that, Matthew says that, Luke says that, even John has it, and Marcin has it, the difference to all the other four. So in the second century, in about 177, the synoptic comparison was one of five, and the competition that we have in the, fourth, in the second century is a competition of five. The loser, and now we come back to the uh, argument from silence, the loser is the one of which we have least, as most in most of the cases in history. Now, if we wouldn't go for the argument from silence, we would take the leftovers as making the most substantial claims. That's what New Testament studies are. What we've got is the most reasonable basis for truth. And here's the interest of the argument from silence. Because the argument from evidence is always the argument of the winners. The argument from silence is the argument of a Watson and a Sherlock Holmes, because you need a bit of gray cells. Because it's not bloody evident. Evidence is what wins in, this, in, in, in the obvious. And that's why I prefer crime stories where the obvious isn't already told in the first scene, where I have to work it through. And that's what historians, I think, should do and what New Testament scholars usually don't. Why? Not because they are bloody idiotic. No, because it serves their purpose. It's a reconfirmation of a romantic idea that Christianity started in the first century with all the evidence that we have and with everything Irenaeus explains us how it would have it would have been. And because that serves this orthodox game to win the competition, I think. That's why the, the, the competitive winners are still making their arguments today. How does that sound, Mike? You, you mentioned, you know, some of the, your position on dating already. Obviously, if Marcus and what he's saying is right, then maybe we push it a bit later. Does any of that resonate with you and, and, and your initial findings? It does. You know, it reminds me of um, how the sophists are treated in studies of classical rhetoric. You know, when we traditionally begin, you know, teach students rhetorical theory, we begin with the sophists, but we don't really know that much about the sophists, and that's because they didn't really write that much down. Their critics wrote a lot, however, and their critics are also sophists themselves, but they're sort of like stealth <laughs> sophists who are, have their own schools and are trying to recruit students, right? So they can't, their portrait of the sophists when, you know, uh, I, Socrates writes against the sophists or antidosis, you know, it's a caricature, right? Um, yeah. But it's a caricature that has, you know, a kernel of truth in it. And I think, you know, the, the same sort of process of intuitive discovery is going on here. We can extract maybe some of the truth of Marcon from Tertullian and Irenaeus that we're very, very careful about it. And I think Marx's reconstruction of the text is a massive undertaking that is very much overdue. Um, and it has the advantage over Q. And my... my the problem with Q has always been is that it is a very clever thing to pull it out of Matthew and Luke, but I, there is no mention of it in the ancient, in the ancient commentator. But with Marcon, he's all over the place. People can't shut up about him. We have mentions of letters where he is complained about that we don't have the text, but we know people were talking about him pretty much constantly. He's, a, he's the hot topic in the second century. There's no discussion of Q. Um, so we can begin with, there is actually a text to reconstruct there. Whereas with Q, it's, to me, it's kind of wishful thinking. 
we want that earlier tradition, so we're going to pull it out of the text any way we can. And it does kind of seem to be there where we can explain it the same way by just saying, well, um, Luke read Matthew, um, which is a big ask because of what he does to the Sermon on the Mount. But that can be explained, too. It can also be explained if he's also not just responding to Mark and Matthew. He's also responding to this earlier Markon gospel, or he's responding to an Ur Mark, or however which way we want to spin it. Um, there's more that he's responding to that we don't have access to. I thought about a metaphor about this earlier today. I have two sons. You'll find unsurprisingly that their names are Luke and Matthew. Unfortunately, my <laughs> son is Luke, so I'm going about it in the wrong order, right? I'm not. I'm done with sons, by the way. I'm not going to collect the whole set. Um, but you know, they they have a lot of puzzles. You know, they're they're kids, and I find pieces of these puzzles in the dynamic actually. You know, over the years, they they no longer have this the little thirty piece puzzles anymore. But occasionally, I'll find a piece for them underneath a couch or something. You know. And occasionally, you know, I'll find one that matches it, and then I'll, you know, then I'll have like three or four of them, perhaps, perhaps five of them. And I know that there's a 30-piece puzzle somewhere, but those pieces are lost. They were thrown away. A dog ate them. A cat pissed on them. Something along those lines. They're lost to history. But I know that there's a larger puzzle there that I can reconstruct by looking at the picture, right? I know there's more there, but I don't have access to it. I don't remember what the puzzle looked like. Maybe it's got a cat on it. Maybe it's something like that. But we can infer, we can create this sort of argument from silence. Just because the pieces aren't there doesn't mean there's a lot more pieces there. And hopefully somewhere, you know, in the next hundred years, someone will dig up another jar in Egypt that has a, a cache of more of these. But that one actually solved the problem. It will just add more questions. It will make the competition more rich. Um, the, mo the most ironic thing I can think about New Testament t studies is that the Gospel of Thomas didn't settle any questions. It just added more questions to ask. <laughs> it made things more complicated. And you look at it, the first glance, you think, oh, no, this is, this, is proof, this is proof that there's a saying source. Q, that we've got access to John the Baptist and the Essenes. Not really. It just complicates things more. And... I know this is very pessimistic, but if we dug up a copy of Marcon's Gospel from the second century tomorrow, I don't think that would solve the question either. Because we need a critical direction. It'd take another hundred years of scholarship to really nail it down, and even then, you'd have a tractor. But that's always my sense of it. In the introduction to the book, I compare the synoptic problem to... Uh, the pursuit of Jack the Ripper. We're never going to find out who Jack the Ripper is, but boy, there are a lot of people who claim they have found Jack the Ripper and they settled the issue. And but all there is is the field of the, the arena of the competition that Marcus is talking about. You know, the competition is more important than the actual solution to some point. Um, and what we're doing when we're trying to solve these historical problems or get a piece of them and get, gain an understanding of one puzzle piece, again, we're reconstructing, as he says, you know, what the original gospel authors are doing is they're trying to fashion a Jesus for their own purposes. And when they see another gospel, that's an invitation to invite their, to invent their own. And, um, and this is, what I'm about to say is kind of a, a truism, is that a fourfold gospel is more useful for a church that needs to have a more flexible theological doctrine than a church that has one gospel. You can mix and match. Um, if the theology of one gospel becomes problematic, well, we can go back to Matthew. If Matthew becomes problematic, we can go back to the, the, the more aggressive Christology of John. If that becomes problematic, we can go back to um, the histories and the Hebrew scriptures, which, and then we get a proof text that goes both ways. Um, whereas if you lock it down to one text, you've backed yourself into a corner. Now you've got to defend it, get into um, the situation Irenaeus is in. It seems to me, you know, when I read it, that this is not an argument he particularly wants to make but he's stuck with it. 
he's inherited it to some extent. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so he makes rid ridiculous claims like, you know, the four, they, there must be four gospels. There's four, my nine-year-old wouldn't buy that argument. <laughs> and Luke, perhaps he wrote a gospel himself. Um, it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense, but he's having to grasp at straws. But he's also writing for a position of strength, in the sense that he has a proto-orthodox church behind him, and we can see the weight of tradition pushing down. Now, is it the weight of tradition that emerged in his lifetime? That's something that troubles me is is Irenaeus old enough to remember when there wasn't a fourfold gospel is this a lie that he or a, a fiction that he is aware of or is he just sort of you know okay Irenaeus defend the four gospels for us um, they've always been around um, I'm also curious as to when Je when Justin was converted he seems to be converted when he was a young man does he remember when the so-called memoirs of the Oscar the apostles were not written, or excuse me, not read on Sundays. Is that a new thing or a recent thing? It's up in the air. It's tantalizing. It's, I think, it troubles me. I think it rather looks like a more recent one when he talks about the so called gospels. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be a long tradition. I mean, the things he is familiar with, he doesn't say so called, right? And just age-wise, I mean, when Irenaeus writes in the, let's say, 177, 80, he must have been about 40, 50, certainly not 70, 80. So he might go back in history to 100 and whatever, 10, 20. When um, Justin dies, I mean, he, he's certainly also a second century uh, person. Marcion dies in 161 at the latest because uh, everybody says he doesn't, he's not alive when Mark Aurel is emperor. And Clement and others say, well, he's the oldest of all of them. So he might go back to, let's say, 80, 90 being born. So what, what do they still knew? I mean, that's a big question. And when, when they are writing, they are writing around the mid second century. So what's left? It's very difficult. And they're also not, they're not writing in, in, a, in a way that demands an immediate reply. It's yeah. not like, you know, all the gospel writers get together on a weekend <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're posting online and, you know, I have a new gospel, you know, post the PDF and then people reply to it. You know, you know, I don't like this story. I'm going to add this and write my own gospel. You know, it might take years for a gospel to circulate and then someone to say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to write my own. And if when you write your own, it's not like there's a fact checker sitting there in Jerusalem or Rome saying, well, you know, this one is older than that one. So disregard that one and read this one. Or the opposite reasoning, this one is new. So disregard it because it's not as old as the other one. Is there some central authority doing that? No. Um, no. And if you write a gospel in Rome, the, and a bishop in Alexandria wants to contest it, well, if someone in Rome wants to complain about that gospel, they're going to have to send somebody to Alexandria. That's a month at least. Um, there's a lot of delay. Yeah, that's why, and I'll tell you, Mike, that's why I've, I've, I've been less and less convinced that, A, from the first gospel to the last one, uh, we have a stretch of 30, 40 years, let alone we have a geographical stretch around the Mediterranean. Texts that are so closely related that as these five Gospels, they, they need to have been produced in some kind of temporal and geographical proximity. And I think if you really want to talk about competition, which I think is right, I would even think that uh, they all knew of each other's work. And that we have a cross contamination between these texts. That's why all these synaptic uh, studies never can come to one single explanation. Because when you look at certain passages, you think, oh, clear, Mark's first, yeah. 
But then you, you look at those two, uh, and I've just looked at uh, resurrection stories t- today again, right? So you can see, oh, Mark and Matthew are close. And when all, when, whenever there is a, f- a, a verse in, in the Gospel of Mars, and, uh, as far as we can reconstruct them, uh, all four or all five seem to have joint text. And whenever uh, text is missing in Marcion, all the other four go astray. You can even see it in, in the basic outline. Uh, in Marcion's text, the gospel starts with the adult. And so, is, so are all the others. Even when we have child stories like in Matthew and Luke, they restart their story with the adult. And very similarly, Marcion has only a resurrection. I mean, just the, the fact of the resurrection. And and one appear well, if, if there is an appearance, I mean, one encounter. And and exactly the end, where it's uh, about the ascension, and you've written about it here, yeah? uh, there we have the loose ends. And you can, you can boil it down to these small passages, right? And... Um, But then there are other passages where you think, oh, no, John must be earlier or or Matthew or or Luke, right? And and I think that happens if if Tertullian were right, that Marcion knew of these other four when he published his text. And that's always what I'm saying. He is also right that the others are earlier than Marcion's text. So Marcion is not the first gospel, not the Marcion text that he has. It's, it's, a, it's a, a text which has already the knowledge of the other four. But I think it is, again, a romantic idea that these Gospels are put, or we can put them on the, on the washing line, yeah? A is first, B is second, C is third, and D and E come later. No, I think it is a, a big competitive mixture where all of them, knew, and, and I think that's only possible in, a, in, 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 in some kind of proximity, all know the texts of the others, and they borrow from each other. They might not have liked each other, but they have at least sympathy for some of the texts, and, and then try their best on their own. And then 30, 40, 50 years later comes Irenaeus, who, like Tertullian, has a clear-cut view but even in ironies, we have two or three different arrangements whenever he talks about those four. So it's always another one which comes first. And, and when I've made the comparison then, for example, the lists he gives to the way in book three and four and five, where he talks section by section through them, the, the, the order is different from the list that he gives. So I think until the end of of uh, of him writing, uh, the, there is no A B C D E, but it's it's like um, like your puzzle of the kids. You mentioned the ascension. I I, I think I you, you've read my chapter on that. Um, yeah. Another, another strange little addition to the puzzle is that inconsistency between uh, the being of Acts and the end of Luke that I can't quite wrap my hand around if they're written by the same person. How do you contradict yourself? Did you not have access to your own gospel? Um, how do you explain that? The only way I could figure it out is, that, is to say, well, that was written by a different person. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, is to me, you know, it's pretty clear that Acts is, you know, the most apologetic text in the New Testament. It is trying to yeah. gather everything up, get Peter and Paul on the same page, um, tidy up Judas, um, get the church history settled down. Uh, and it, but at the same time, it's curiously detached from the Gospels. It doesn't have that sort of it has. If you took that introduction off, it would be completely unmoored. It'd be like a ship passing the other ships in the ocean. Um, the wee passages, um, not to be mentioned here. Uh, it's a. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a. 
it's a confounding puzzle, but I'm still interested in it. Of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps drawing me back in. Um, so I've written a couple of other things that are related. Um, I've written about First John. I've written about um, um, origins, uh, the, the, the criticism of Greek rhetoric in the uh, Contra Celsum. Actually, that's that's something that bears on this is that uh, you know when Origen uh, reproduces Celsus, it's almost in a what is the word obsessive compulsive fashion. It's almost <laughs> unprecedented. It's, it's it's worse than Tertullian. It's like I have to pause here to reproduce the text. And it has done at such a level that you know the, the, the English edition I have that. And where did he get this habit from? Why does he need to do this? And it seems that, along with his other sort of compositional habits, is that he's arguing with a dead man. And like Tertullian is also arguing with a dead man. And he's even putting words in his mouth, like you said. He's not there, so let's prop him up like you know, Weekend at Bernie's and have him deliver his arguments, right? Um, but with Origin, it's like, well, you know, this isn't fair. We've really got to even the playing field. Christianity is on the ascendance in the third century. I've got to prop up this pagan critic because he sounds ridiculous and make his arguments a little, seem a little better. Um, you know, I, I wonder if a little of that is going on for Tillin. We've got to make this dead guy a little bit more lively. Because the contest is over, the four gospels have won. Um, I'm kicking a dead horse at this point. Um, yeah, on on Acts, I think on Acts. When I read your paper, I would agree with that tendency of Acts to to harmonize and to wrap things up, right? And, um, and I'm convinced like you that uh, we're dealing with different authors here. However, it's interesting. Um, Acts needs a bit of breathing space to put in his early church, right? So he needs those 40 days. And I think he also is harmonizing John with Luke because John, as you say, has a bit of more breathing spaces than just the one day. And as he, as, as the per person that puts together acts are putting together those very different characters like Paul and Peter and John, um, it's also a putting together the very different, um, well, datings and, and, and things that he uh, in, encounters in, in those gospels, right? Um, and it acts as a bridge. It is certainly a bridging. Um, I have thought about that the person, I mean, if, if we took again Jack's suggestion just for a moment, wherever, whoever has written the first gospel, right? But if, if let's say for a moment, um, Marston's text, whoever has written it, Marston's text were earlier than Luke, then in Marcion, there is no ascension. So if, if Luke had been the first version to have done the, or one of the versions who has done a revision and included a one day after Jesus' death uh, ascension, and John has done a similar one, but needed a bit more space and, and left a bit more more days passed before the ascension, right? My my view could or it could be that Acts, which is only known in in the times of Irenaeus, that uh, at the time of Irenaeus we have to do with a second rewriting, and for the purpose of bringing these four gospels into the collection that that Irenaeus makes a case for, you also need a kind of a bridge that holds these texts together. And indeed, in Acts, you get all these people of whom we then have writings in 
the data collection that we call from the third century onwards New Testament. So you have John, you have uh, James, and you have all the others, right? You have, and, and what's not in Acts, you find in either the pseudo um, Pauline texts that are very close, I think, to Acts as well, and the deutero Pauline ones. So if you put all things together, yes, you get this kind of a, of a collection where it somehow not always fits, but it, it, it keeps things together. They are not always consistent. And as you were saying, and I think the strength of a collection is that it's not just to do with the Gospels. I think the strength of a collection is that it's bigger than one text. And that's something we can be, or we are taught in history. If you just put out a text, a letter, one email, you, you get nowhere. Or very rarely. It must be a brilliant email, right? Which gets you to the end. Yeah? Usually you write five, yeah? But if you've got a collection of 10 or of 70 letters or of 120 letters, they're always more efficient than having a collection of three letters. So in Ignatius, you have seven that, that trump out the three. But as soon as we've got 16 letters, 13 letters, 17 letters, you don't get the, three, the seven letters. So the bigger collection is the winner. And I think the 27 book collection and the four gospels were the winner over the one and the 27 were the winner over the 10. So I think that's, that's just historical development. Yeah. I, I'm absolutely fascinated by, um, and I've been thinking about the whole time that you both were talking about this competition business, um, particularly, Mike, as you raised it as happening also in other Greek schools, whether of philosophers, rhetoricians, whatever, I'm sure politicians. And I, I'm conscious at the moment that we are currently going through an election here in the UK, a bit like in the US, and everything's about getting your information out there, your pamphlets, your um, getting people effectively to your school to vote for you. And it strikes me so much that, um, that this competitive element is crucial because if you don't get followers into your school, if you aren't bringing people into Alexandria or, or um, Rome or wherever you might be, then that's, that's the end of you. So it becomes a career game as much as it becomes a dogmatic game, you know, and you mentioned the obsession, and I've uh, said it on the podcast before, Mike, you know, with some of these guys looking at Celsus, looking at Marcion. And I think that one of the reasons that they're so desperate to deal with these guys is because of their impact, because their schools were so large, because they had still an impact into the, we know the Marcionites, into the fourth century and beyond. So that, yes, Marcion may die, but the legacy of the man who started this school and the men that he trained lived long on well after his death. In fact, even now I know, I'm aware that there's a Marcionite church that started in the, really? in the 20th century somewhere in, in Eastern Europe. Whether Marcion would approve, I do not know. But um, I think that that, that competitive element is really important because it spells some of that romantic idea that we have that is perpetuated by the late uh, 19th century scholars like Lightfoot and Zahn because they seek to remove it from the real world in which you and I still live in today, but they certainly lived in back then, one of competition, one of fighting for students, rather than this place of, and there appeared from the four apostles, the four gospels, and they were ever thus like the four winds, as Irenaeus will tell us. Um, it, that's almost a world that's never existed. That's an imaginary world where everyone gets on and is lovely. Yeah, the word I used a lot in the book is political. The Gospels are political texts, as well as religious, literary narratives. Um, you know, in rhetorical theory, you usually take a, something of an extreme position, or at least I do, that um, the only measure of rhetoric is effect. Not the logic of your arguments, not whether or not you have a warrant between two claims. It's whether or not you convinced people. And this assumes that we're living in, a, an, as Perlman and Albright's Titeca would say, we're living in a world that has no, you know, where objective value uh, judgments cannot be made. So if I declare that you know, Jesus ascended after 40 days and I can convince people, then that's what works. And then if there's another text that says he ascended after a day and the 40 days when 
becomes more popular and becomes copied and followed and worshipped, it won in the contest of texts. Um, it doesn't matter which one is newer or older or which one was published before the other. One won and one lost. Unless, of course, like the four Gospels, they somehow attached themselves to each other in this process and survived as a group. Um, almost kind of like... A, uh, what is the metaphor? Um, individual parts of a gene um, sort of grouping together and then expressing themselves as the fourfold gospel together, gaining a new trait. Um, I'm positive that, well, that there's one thing I can say is that none of the evangelists could have predicted that that was going to happen. When they were writing those gospels, they were writing the gospel, not oh, I'm going to be in a collection of four, and you know, there's going to be four winners crowned at the end of this process. <laughs> no, they're running the gospel. And you can really see that in an introduction to Luke. It's like, after this, you know, Theopolis, you, you won't need to read any other gospels because you will now have the orderly account that you want it, where everything is resolved. And, you know, I went and interviewed Mary, the mother of Jesus, to make sure that I got these quotations right. You know, obviously it didn't happen, but... Things are settled, and you can see that, you know, in you know Marcon's complaint in the antithesis, right, is that, you know, these four gospels have usurped an earlier gospel, and I'm now correcting this, so you have a real gospel that you can, you know, worship and follow that has you know the correct theology. Um, no one says, you know, my gospel is supplementary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't actually have to read my gospel. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a really appropriate place for us to end today, that nobody writes thinking that everyone will forget their work, particularly when the stakes are so high in the founding of a fledgling religion post-Jesus. Yeah. Well, as always, Marcus and Mike, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure to hear your thoughts. And Mike, I think it's been really special to have you on as well because you come at it from a new angle. And I think that one of the things that New Testament studies needs is fresh eyes rather than the stale repetition that we tend to go through in cycles of Q or Farrer or uh, Castilian priority or whatever. You've come out with some really fresh perspectives and I, I really appreciate that. And as always to our viewers, uh, please do subscribe and check out our socials in the description below and also Mike's book if you're interested. And we'll see you all soon. Bye bye. Okay, we're done. Mike, thanks so much. That was great.